Okay, good evening or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, sorry for the late start there. I had a little difficulty with my microphone. Uh, maybe if someone could raise their hand to indicate that you hear me now. Um, okay, good. Thanks, Eugene. So, uh, so we are uh, we're in our fourth week in the Writing Wikipedia Articles class. Uh, and last week we introduced the final project for the class in which you will be improving an existing Wikipedia article one step on the quality rating scale or starting a new article. So hopefully everyone has had a chance to choose their article uh, and at least put a little thought into what they're going to do with it. I know that some of you have started working on your articles. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, to briefly uh, take a look at uh, at something on our course page before we get into the main section of today's class, which is going to be we have uh, we have several guest Wikipedians to talk with us, uh, but I want to make sure that everyone's in good shape on the assignment first. And uh, there's one thing in particular I'd like to point out. Uh, so I'm going to just start up the web browser here, and uh, let's see. So. If you're looking at our main course page, and you scroll all the way down to the bottom, a few of you have, have discovered this, but I don't think I put it explicitly in the instructions. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back and, and do that. Uh, but if you have enrolled in the course on the Wikipedia page, which you do with this Enroll button, uh, this is down towards the bottom of the page. Uh, so once you're looking at the page and you're logged into your account, you just click on Enroll there. And then once you've done that, you should show up in this list of students. And then once you show up in the list of students, you can add an article. So I'm going to scroll down. This I'm using my Pete Forsyth demo account. So on your own line, you'll have the ability to add an article by typing in the, in the name. And be sure it's the exact name of the Wikipedia article, capitalization and everything has to match. And click on Add Article. And this is going to make it easier for us to to keep track of your edits and see what you're working on. So if you haven't done this yet, don't worry at all. It's not a problem. But it will be helpful to us uh, towards the end as, uh, as you really get going with your article and as you near completion of the assignment. So uh, I am, uh, I'm curious if there's anyone here who has started with their assignment and would like to, uh, to tell us what they've chosen to work on. Uh, or any questions or ideas that have come up. We'll just take a, a few minutes and, uh, and take a look at a couple of assignments before we move on to our panelists. Uh, and you can feel free to raise your hand, or uh, if you want to turn on your microphone, you can talk to us or bring something up in the chat window. So. Okay. So Glenn, um, so you're reviving a stub about the epistemology of Wikipedia. So um, is that the exact title of the article? Can I just type that in here? I don't think it's not coming up. So epistemology, I think I spelled that right. So I'm not sure yep. why that's not coming up. That's it there. The Larry Sanger article there, Origins of Wikipedia. Oh, I see. And I just came across a couple of other articles talking about the epistemology of of Wikipedia. So I did, did just that and, and was looking for it on Wikipedia. Uh, seeing nothing, I came across this and I thought this might be a good, uh, good project to sort of uh, try and level up. OK. So that sounds, sounds like an interesting one. Um, it, it, do you want to tell us anything, any more details about what you <laughs> What you That's want to do about with it? all I know about it so far because uh, I've been reading a couple of other sort of scholarly articles about the same topic and issue. So I hope to incorporate them into developing this this stub a little bit further. So sure, 
Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, anyone else? Oh, yes, uh, I see Laurie just reminded us we have our Etherpad, so the link is uh, in the chat window there. So please feel free to use that and to add notes and links as we go along. Uh, someone maybe could put in this, the link to the page that we just pulled up that Glenn showed us. So if there's no one else who uh, wants to show us an article, let's just move right to our panelists. Pete, so we, we, did, we did have another uh, one there. Experienced Wikipedians are pretty... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I see. Laurie. Uh, so, Laurie, you've chosen the article on an orchid. And I'm not going to try to pronounce that name. Uh, but I am going to, let's see, I think the easiest way for me to get to it is to go to your user page. Let's see. And, uh, And I think you put a link here, if I remember. Oh, you at least put in the title. I guess I could have copy and pasted just from the chat. So, oh. so there we go. So you've so this is just a stub, but it looks like a lovely flower. And I'm sure there's all kinds of scientific information that can be added to this article. So I think this is a great choice, and really looking forward to seeing what you come up with. This. Um, I'm going to just click on the talk page. OK, so not much there yet. So I think you have something that uh, nobody has really put a lot of effort into yet. And you should have a good opportunity to really build this up. Um, and I think anyone who is watching the page will be very happy to see you building it out. So please keep us surprised as you develop that. So uh, Pete, she also, so, yeah, she I, also yes. sorry, I guess our, our sound isn't quite synced up. I was going to say she also invited someone else to work with her on it on their talk page, and they accepted. So there was a little bit of team collaboration surrounding that that choice. Excellent. OK, great. Um, so I am, it seems like we are having some tech issues. I'm going to just stop my uh, recording here that I'm making, and it'll make the YouTube version a little tougher to create, but I'll just come back and do that manually later. I think I might be eating up too much network bandwidth on my end. Anyhow, um, so we have today with us uh, three uh, experienced Wikipedians and Wikimedia and Wiki people uh, who have pretty different backgrounds from each other, but have offered to come and tell us some stories about interesting things that they have encountered in the Wikipedia space. Um, and particularly, we're looking for uh, for some stories of how articles have developed or how articles have had an impact on the wider world. So uh, you've, you've heard from me and examples that I've brought up in the previous classes a few times that Wikipedia is such a, a huge and diverse place that uh, I think you really only start to get a sense of, of how it works when you hear from a variety of people. So hopefully this will help feed your imagination as you're starting to engage with your final project and give you a chance to ask some some questions and have some discussion later in the class. So uh, I am going to, well, I'll just give a brief introduction of all three. And then uh, I think, why don't we start with Lane, who joined us in the last session. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Eugene and Stephen after him. So Lane Raspberry is, uh, has been editing Wikipedia almost daily since 2008. Uh, he's living in New York and works as a Wikipedian in residence for the nonprofit consumer advocacy organization, Consumer Reports, which uh, I think will be a very familiar name to anyone based in the US. Uh, he edits Wikipedia specifically about health articles, ab about health uh, topics, and has a lot of interest in improving access to high quality information around health. Um, and then after Lane, we're going to hear from Eugene Eric Kim. Uh, Eugene is a he is a co-founder of the consulting agency Group Haya, uh, and has been in the consulting space for I think about a decade. Uh, lately, he's working on a really excellent project, um, which is the uh, the Changemaker Bootcamp, in which he's uh, helping people effect, seeking to affect change in a variety of organizations uh, improve their influence, um, and. The, perhaps the, the strongest connection in our work is that he designed and ran the Wikimedia Foundation's year-long 
five-year strategic plan process uh, in, which, in which it developed a five-year five strategic plan by engaging about a thousand volunteers around the world, uh, all, di all different kinds of stakeholders in Wikipedia, so editors and programmers and readers, uh, people with all different kinds of connections with Wikipedia. And through that process, I think really got, uh, had a lot of opportunity to connect with a wide variety of Wikipedians, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to, to tell us about today. Uh, and finally, we're going to hear from Stephen Le Port. Uh, Stephen uh, joined us briefly uh, in our in our or um, not briefly, but uh, at the last minute for our lab session last week. Uh, we were both online, and he agreed to join us uh, and talked a little bit about Wikisource. So Wikisource is a sister project of Wikipedia, and um, and a, one that is uh, is very much of interest, I think, in the open educational resources space because it's a it's a place to um, reproduce works that are published uh, in the public domain or under a free license. Uh, and so Stephen has been active for some time, um, both on Wikipedia and Wikisource, and uh, in the last couple of years uh, has taken a position as legal counsel to the Wikimedia Foundation, where he's been uh, involved in improving the, uh, the various different legal aspects of what Wikipedia does, or uh, what Wikimedia does to protect all the different stakeholders in its sphere. So uh, without further ado, why don't we turn it over to Lane, and what do you have for us today, Lane? Uh, do you have a microphone? <laughs> we didn't uh, fully test the mics beforehand, so it could be that we, oh, okay. Okay, so I see. Um, Lane, have you hit the talk button as well? Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay. Yes. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, let's see. Could, is it also possible for me to share my screen? Can I show you my computer? Yes, it, it should be. Um, let's let's give you moderator privileges, and uh, we should be able to sort that out. Um, so yes, in the well, Sarah, do you want to talk him through this? Uh, you're the one who shares your screen, Pete. Okay. Yes, that's true. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a little bit of chaos on my desktop here. I, technology does not seem to be my friend today. So, um, Lane, in the uh, in the top of the screen, there you'll see a a little rectangle with a squiggle. That's the whiteboard, and to the right of that yes. is application sharing. Yes. Yeah. So, if you choose application sharing, and then choose your web browser, if it's Chrome or Firefox, uh, whatever application you use as your web browser, it will then show us your screen. Um, you should keep in mind as you do that that it may, if if you, if your web browser is not at the front, if you come back to Blackboard Collaborate, it will gray out anything that's behind the chat window. So you want to stay in your web browser as you do this. Okay. So are are you able to see my browser? Uh, it is not coming up just yet. So uh, there is a uh, there may be a check bo check box that says follow me. Okay. Can you can you see my can you see my browser now? Yes. Yes. How do you do, everyone? My name is Lane Raspberry. Uh, as Pete said, I've been editing Wikipedia every day for uh, some years now. The reason why I edit Wikipedia it's not because I I had some strong desire to write what I could, uh, write encyclopedia articles. It's just that uh, what happened was I, I I came to Wikipedia because I was searching for something on Google and Wikipedia articles kept coming up. And I saw a problem with a particular article. I edited it. I, I, I changed something in the article for whatever reason. I don't know what bug bit me that made me do that. But what was interesting to me is after I edited an article, I realized Wikipedia isn't so much about the encyclopedia. 
uh, from the editor's perspective. What it's about is the collaboration behind the scenes with people who share your interests, no matter how nuanced or specialized those interests are. So if you ever see a Wikipedia article and it's on a highly specialized topic, you can bet that that article was made by people who care a lot about that topic. And if you also care about that, if you look behind the scenes of the Wikipedia article through how it was created, you'll meet people who share your, your, your very specialized interests. So uh, going forward a, a few years from when I started editing, so initially what happened was I edited a Wikipedia article and then somebody responded to what I did. And I didn't realize that there was this community behind Wikipedia that would support anyone who steps up to do anything. So I, I came to understand about that, and I came to depend on the community. And what I'd like to do for uh, perhaps three minutes is I want to lead you through a, an example of how somebody can start something on Wikipedia, and then it can be picked up by others, and uh, they can de develop the idea that someone, someone initiates. So uh, I happen to be interested in politics in India, and for some months, in uh, 2010, perhaps about six months, maybe nine months, I was reading about this scandal that was happening, and it was it was over quite a bit of money. The government was uh, some members of the government were alleged to have uh, mismanaged some money, and uh, when they were doing their balance sheet, uh, a large amount of money, uh, about 30 billion dollars, came up missing, and uh, people started looking into wh where did the money go, what had happened with it. I was trying to search for information about this this scandal or this scam on Google, and the first the first thing that I came to notice was that there was no particular name in the news media for this scandal. Uh, so when I was when I would search for information about it, I would have to search for the politicians who were supposed to be involved or the journalists that I knew were covering this issue. But in every different news article that I was reading, the scandal was being called by a different name. So also when I looked for the scandal on Wikipedia, there was no, there was no article for it. And the reason why I think that the scandal was in the news media for so long without, uh, without anyone making a Wikipedia article for it was because no one knew what to call it. And so uh, I, I created a Wikipedia article, and I, I gave it the very boring name. I called it the 2G Spectrum Scam. It was about the, the 2G uh, spectrum of, of cell phone technology and some money associated with that, and I, I called it the, the 2G Spectrum Scam. And I linked this article to the names of the politicians that were supposed to be involved in it, either judging the case or uh, had, had some control over what was happening in the case. Well. Not so long, like within within a week of me setting up this this article, a lot of it started getting a lot of traffic, and a lot of people started contributing to it. Uh, since since I since I set up the article, it's just so many people have continued to um, uh, look at it, make changes, propose all kinds of things. So what I did here, uh, in, I, I don't know if any of you are new. But here we are at the Wikipedia article. If you click View History, you can see everyone who's ever contributed to the article and every version of the article that's ever existed. And if I could show you, when I first set up the article, it was rather short. It was it was slight on sources. I had I had nine sources when I set it up. And uh, not so long after I set it up, it got so much development. And if you look at it right now, um, it's got 250 Wait. different sources. A, a lot of people, yes, Pete. Yeah, Question. I just want to break in. The um, the screen takes a moment to refresh. Uh, yeah. So as you're clicking around, if you can pause a little bit longer on each screen, it, it, sometimes as you click, it's, it's, it hasn't Excuse quite me. fully loaded the previous screen. Okay. Excuse me. So looking at the article as it is now, um, it's got more content than uh, uh, because so many people have contributed to it, and a, a huge number of more references. So if you look the the pages just full of, of uh, references to different sources that are talking about this issue. But I want to show you deeper behind the scenes of, of what's going on. So uh, again, if you click on history of the article, you can see different see information about the contributors. And I told you, anyone, if you can imagine, anyone who's developed this article, it's because they're interested in talking about the topic. And before, there wasn't really a forum for people to um, uh, discuss how to describe this article. And I feel like this Wikipedia article became a, a forum for 
um, discussion of development of how this, this topic should be explained. So first, to give you some idea of the traffic, if you click page view statistics, you can see the traffic to the article. I recommend doing this to, to any article if you're interested in looking for a place to collaborate. And you can see this article is getting over 20,000 views per month. Uh, and this is, this is an issue that's been going on for some years. Another thing that one can look at is uh, uh, who's contributed to the article. So you click contributors here, and you get a list of everyone who's ever made any, any contribution to the article. And you can see it's, it's quite a lot of people. And you get a, uh, the number of counts that they've made. Typically, most of the people who've come to this article, they make one or two edits. But uh, it's that the, even that the editors who only do one or two things, more often than not, what they do is a significant contribution that improves and develops the articles. And the people who come and edit just once or twice, they've made up uh, more than half of the content in this article. And then a few editors have, have edited more than the rest. But something else that's really interesting is that if you go to the history, you can also check the number of people who are watching this article. So as you, as you may know, we, if you logged into Wikipedia, you have a watch list. You can watch any pages to see when someone's making edits to them. Uh, so you can be informed and, and speak back to anyone who has a questions or comments. And if you check the watch list through the history page, there's uh, 57 people watching this page. That means if, if there's ever any problem with this article, they're going to have some kind of response to it, uh, a significant number of those people. And uh, you can usually uh, expect that if, if a page has a, a lot of watchers, those are from active Wikipedians who really are on by to answer any questions or, or comments that anyone might have. Uh, what what really made me happy was that uh, a few months after I had set up this, these pages or this page, uh, it started consistently getting a name in Google News. So whereas before no one was calling this by any particular name, and as I said, I, I watched this issue for months. As soon as a Wikipedia article appeared uh, describing this political topic uh, in in so many different news sources, they they started calling it after the name of the Wikipedia article, 2G Spectrum Scam. And so I feel like the only reason why more people weren't talking about this issue was because there wasn't initial infrastructure set up around which people could begin to have discussions on it. And once I just took the small step of setting up a Wikipedia article and putting just a, a bare amount of content in it, then that was enough for other people to add their perspectives to the article. And it came to be developed into probably almost certainly, it's the most thorough explanation of the issue anywhere you would find on the internet. And almost any explanation that's written anywhere else is going to be based from what's in the Wikipedia article. Um, so I, this is just one case. But if you talk to other Wikipedians, I think that you would find that many other Wikipedians will tell you that they've had an experience where either they've started something and seen a lot of people pile onto it and add their perspectives. Or otherwise, they, they've been in this situation also where they recognize that uh, something, there was a conversation waiting to happen if somebody were to just initiate it. Uh, so that's all. Thank you. That's my story. Very cool, Ann. Thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, you're right. It is a familiar story that I've, I, I've experienced and seen some variants on. But that's a really compelling example you've got there, uh, especially where it's an issue that had gone so long without having a Wikipedia article or coordinated uh, media coverage. So thank you. Yes. Uh, Eugene, are you ready to go next? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you, Lane. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Pete, for uh, giving me a chance to uh, say hello and to uh, talk a little bit about my experiences. Um, in a lot of ways, I'm sort of the polar opposite of, uh, of Lane uh, when it comes to Wikipedia. Um, Lane's been editing every day since 2008. Um, I have been a casual typo corrector for basically most of my history with Wikipedia, with uh, a couple of uh, exceptions. Um, I first started using wikis in 2000, which actually predates Wikipedia. And I think one of the early experiences I had with the wikis that I was using um, is very similar to what Lane uh, was talking about. And it's something I've heard Ward Cunningham say about uh, wikis in general. 
um, which is you, you know, if you try to define what a wiki is, you know, there's a lot of things that you can point to. But I think probably sort of the universal, like, positive experience that most people have had with wikis, and I think it's sort of the defining kind of ideal of what a wiki is, is when you go, you put something out there, you go away for a little while, you come back, and you see that other people have come and kind of magically made, you know, your your work better. And um, I guess the story I want to share with all of you is that, you know, when it's working well, it seems like magic. Um, and it's really just a wonderful feeling. And it's probably something that all of you uh, who have uh, been exploring this so far have experienced on some level. Um, sometimes, because it seems so magical, it's easy to forget that behind all of the magic are just a bunch of normal people, just like all of you, um, who are passionate about a particular topic, who are going around, who have discovered a page for whatever reason, and who feel compelled to edit it in the same way all of you feel compelled to edit content. Um, what I really like about Lane's presentation was he was going through and he was stepping through and showing the behind the scenes of, you know, of the actual kind of social elements of what makes a page a page, which isn't always immediately apparent. What I want to really do through just a couple of stories is really emphasize how important it is to remember that there are people behind all of these pages. Um, sometimes, uh, especially as a casual editor, um, it can be uh, a challenging experience to come on board to make a change or to attempt to do something um, and then to get reverted or to get a message that may not be clear or may not seem particularly pleasant, you know, and uh, just to really understand that, um, you know, the Wikipedia principle of assume good intent um, is at play and that everyone is a person who is trying to, you know, just help the cause. Um, it's, it's just a really important thing to just try and discipline yourself to remember as, as you're going through and you're participating. Um, so I'm almost embarrassed to, uh, to share what my uh, original participation on Wikipedia looks like. Um, and uh, basically it consisted of two activities. Uh, the first activity, what I said before, was essentially anonymously fixing typos. Um, and then the second activity was anonymously vandalizing Wikipedia. And I'm serious when I say this, but my intent in vandalizing Wikipedia was, um, as Pete mentioned in his introduction of me, um, I used to, um, and, and still do to some extent, I was working in the collaboration space. And I was, um, you know, what I would do is I would give talks um, to people on, you know, various things that were happening in the world. And one of the things I would give talks on were wikis. Well, one of the best examples of, you know, the magic of, you know, wikis and Wikipedia in particular, would be to open up a page, something that people were interested in in the room, and to say, okay, let's completely vandalize it. So to go through and to edit the page in front of, you know, 100 people in the room, um, to change the content, to save the page so that they know it's live, um, to talk for a few minutes, and then to reload the page. And of course, what would happen back in the old days, um, you would reload the page, and 100% of the time, um, the changes, your vandalism would be reverted and the page would be restored. And so it was sort of a wonderful kind of real-time stunning demonstration of the magic of Wikipedia. Um, and I was doing it really to show, you know, that there were just a lot of people around the world, you know, just monitoring content, you know, taking care of the content. You know, this was sort of answering the question of, you know, well, if it's open, you know, what's going to prevent people from coming in and messing it up? Well, what prevents people from coming in and messing it up um, was uh, is community. Well, I'm telling this story because I used to uh, I used to come and and do this demonstration probably around 2004 uh, is when I started doing it 2004 is 2005, and the community was small enough then, and there were not as many bots that would automatically do reverts and that kind of thing. Um, if you were to try this experiment today, like most likely, unless you were really intentionally trying to screw with articles, like a lot of the more dramatic vandalism that we would do live would just be automatically reverted by bots today. Um, but something interesting happened to me in uh, 2008. 
Uh, I was in Ethiopia at the time. I hadn't given one of these Wikipedia talks uh, in in a while because at this point, you know, Wikipedia had exploded. Um, but I was doing some work in, in Ethiopia, and um, people asked me to talk a little bit about social media. And so I was talking about different things that were happening in social media, and I wanted to talk about wikis. So I decided to use the exact same, you know, uh, demonstration that I always did was I would, you know, vandalize a page, and I would, you know, wait and talk for a few minutes, and then I'd come back, and it would be magically corrected. Well. Um, so I was in Addis Ababa, which is the capital of Ethiopia, and so I decided to change that page around. And I was engaging with the audience, and I asked them what they wanted to change, and they were laughing, and they said, let's change this and that. Um, and what we ended up doing was we changed the population, and we changed it dramatically. I think we said it was like the population of Addis Ababa is 10 billion people. And uh, if any of you have done any work in, in developing countries, you'll know that you know some of these census issues are actually really kind of political and, and important and controversial in a lot of ways. So actually changing the census number, I mean, we changed it dramatically. But actually doing that kind of change is, uh, uh, it could be a pretty controversial thing. But we we're doing it to the extent to just try and make it really clear that it was vandalism. And so I changed the page, I saved it, I was, you know, talking about other things. About a few minutes later, I reloaded the page. It hadn't been reverted. Um, the population of Addis Ababa, according to Wikipedia, for those five minutes was 10 billion people. So I said, no problem, um, you know, we'll just wait a few more minutes. There are a lot more people, there's a lot more content on Wikipedia now, so people aren't going to see these changes as quickly. Uh, I'm just going to hang out and wait a few more minutes and see what happens. So I waited another five minutes, went back, reloaded the page. Content was still there. So now I'm getting kind of nervous. And I'm thinking about, oh, God, you know, there are kids out there right now who are using Wikipedia to do research. And they're pulling up this page, and it's saying that there are 10 billion people, and they're going to put it in the report. And it's really going to screw over a lot of people. So finally, at some point, it was not being changed. I had to go back in. I reverted the edit. And uh, I just sincerely hope that in the 15 minutes that uh, my vandalism was in place, no one got screwed over too much. Um, you know, the point of the story was that you know, the, the nature of the community was changing. The scale was changing. And the fact of the matter was, like at the end of the day, there are a whole lot of people um, on Wikipedia, that's what makes it magical, that's what makes it grows, but there's a lot more content on Wikipedia than there are people. And, um, you know, when you think about sometimes um, how you might edit a page and how, you know, you're, you're, you've got the best intentions, you go, you make a change, maybe you don't cite it or you don't have a citation or you don't go through and, um, uh, you know, follow some Wikipedia guideline or, or whatever. Um, and you get sort of a caustic sounding response from an administrator or another editor um, that can sometimes sound offensive, you got to realize that at the end of the day, there are just a bunch of people who are passionate about the projects um, who are trying to make Wikipedia the best place possible. And frankly, they have to deal with you know goofballs like me who, again, I had good intentions too. I was trying to you know show off the magic of Wikipedia by vandalizing it. And yet, at the end of the day, you know, every time I vandalized Wikipedia, some human being actually had to go and fix it. And so, you know, this is the things that these are the things that we don't think about or remember when we're we're editing Wikipedia. Um, one one thing I will just add, you know, on top of that, because I've been talking a lot about this particular story, uh, is when you interact with Wikipedia, when you make edits. Uh, and when you start engaging with other people, I would say my personal experiences the vast majority of time have really been wonderful. Um, I've rarely had sort of a caustic experience with, with anyone. Um, even when I was doing the strategy project, which was a whole different thing, it had its own set of norms and, and so forth, it was, uh, it was always, it was mostly a positive experience. Um, occasionally you have something that happens where someone's interacting with you and it's just not necessarily a pleasant experience. And you just have to remember, um, you know, if you're engaging in English, sometimes you're engaging with people whose first language is not English. And so again, they have the best intention, 
but they don't necessarily, um, you know, they don't know how to express it in a way that's tactful or polite or that kind of thing. And uh, I think, you know, what makes Wikipedia work um, and work well is just, you know, being really conscious of the people behind it and to the best extent, you know, trying to be empathetic um, and, again, trying to assume uh, good intentions. And thank you for all of the, the commentary on chat. I was greatly amused as I was telling these stories. Oh, great. Well, thanks for sharing that, Eugene. Uh, it really is an excellent perspective and something we haven't touched on so much in class is the, uh, the, the existence of many different language editions of Wikipedia and also, as you say, uh, people engaging on Wikipedia, on English Wikipedia, because it is the biggest one um, and, you know, maybe the most important one uh, to their purposes, but English might not be their second language, their first language at all. Uh, and you definitely get situations where there are um, confusions or disagreements that arise out of uh, cultural or linguistic uh, mismatches. And it really is a beautiful thing when people work through them, but it can be a frustrating thing in the process, too. So thank you very much for drawing our attention to that. Um, and Stephen, do you have something to show us today? And let's, uh, let's bring this last. Uh, Stephen, if, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you short, uh, but it really would be nice if we have 10 minutes or so at the end of class to, uh, to open this up for questions. So if it's possible to keep this under about five minutes, that would be ideal. Of course, if you have more to, sh more to show, I'm sure we'll all be interested. Okay, great. Um, I think I can probably just talk for a little bit, probably under five minutes easily. Um, can you guys all hear me properly? You sound great. Oh, great. So uh, the article I thought I'd show off uh, has a little bit of backstory behind it as well. Um, I was reading about a chef in The New Yorker uh, who had a really interesting story. He was a Chinese... Uh, American chef who opened up a restaurant in uh, somewhere in the southern United States. I believe it started off in Virginia. Um, uh, his name was Peter Chang. He, uh, he was, was a world famous chef who had won awards in China and fled the country for some reason and came to the United States and opened a restaurant. Um, and he had just a captivating story in The New Yorker uh, about his progress here. And he opened up a restaurant. He got a, a, a big review and a bunch of attention on the internet, and mysteriously his restaurant shut down. Um, so people tracked him down to the new, next restaurant he opened up and decided to, uh, and, and I'll pull up the article real quick. Yeah, so people tracked him down to his next restaurant and reviewed it again. And the moment he got any publicity, his restaurant shut down again. Yeah, I'll just load this up on my end so you don't have to worry. Yeah, sure. So uh, he sort of he sort of got an internet cult following behind him, um, where people would would track down his his latest restaurant and then review it, and people would kind of follow him around the U.S. to where his, uh, his latest restaurant had opened up. So I, I after reading this this story in the New Yorker, um, I was just really interested in him, and I decided to you know read up on him and see where he currently was, you know, since he's sort of an internet uh, celebrity who continuously moves around. Um, but when I Wikipedia'd him, I was surprised to see that he didn't actually have a Wikipedia article. So I went around and I found as many sources as I could, the reviews the New Yorker had mentioned, the New Yorker article itself, and a few others, and put together this little Wikipedia article. Um, the Wikipedia article itself hasn't gotten much attention uh, since then, but other people have come in and sort of added updates to his article on, I, I think I wrote the article in 2010, but in 2011, he opened up a new restaurant. He moved again, so someone updated the article. And then in 2012, he opened up a new, art a new restaurant, so someone updated the article again. Uh, so I was excited to see this story that I originally saw as sort of a, a passive thing that I read about in a magazine, and I was able to bring to Wikipedia and all of a sudden sort of be a participant in the story itself, right? Like people are following him around and reviewing him based off of his internet fame, and his internet fame partially comes from his Wikipedia article. Uh, I notice a lot of the edits are from anonymous contributors, but uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's overall, I think, just an interesting story. And 
what, one of the one of my favorite things is when I went to go Google him afterwards, the Wikipedia article showed up higher in the Google results than the original New Yorker article, which I, I also felt a little uh, flattering, right? Like I am not a great writer. I don't think I could ever write for the New Yorker, but I do care enough to take time on you know a Saturday afternoon to write an encyclopedia article about something, and that ends up being more accessible to people through Google than uh, this something that has a lot more prestige or a lot more attention to people. And I think that that sort of accessibility of Wikipedia is what what excites me, right? Like I don't have to be a uh, I don't have to be a world renowned writer in order to write something that other people read. All I have to do is you know care enough about a topic or spend an afternoon in order to to make it accessible. So I, I encourage people to try and find articles that they are interested in that are not necessarily part of the mainstream uh, Wikipedia topics, right? Like if you go in and enter the global warming Wikipedia page and want to make an edit there, you're likely to have a lot of trouble finding a way that you can contribute something new on global warming. It's a topic that's very well researched and edited and a lot of people pay attention to it. But if you find something that is relatively obscure but something that matters a lot to you, other people will care a lot about it and will come and start to edit that article with you. And I think it's a it's an overall more rewarding experience. So I think that that's just the article I wanted to share. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Well, great, thank you, Stephen. Uh, another excellent excellent example. I'm uh, I'm I'm really pleased by. I, I think I just got three stories I've never heard before. So this is pretty fun for me as the instructor as well. Um, I think, Stephen, just to take something you were talking about uh, as a sort of a, a, a jumping off point for some discussion. Uh, of course, anyone who has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but I, one thing that, that you mentioned there was how the Wikipedia article immediately jumped to the top of Google search results when you wrote it. Um, and I think this is something that, that kind of connects to the concept of open educational resources, which is a, a topic of great interest to this class. Uh, many of our students have a background or interest in open educational resources, and many are uh, choosing to work on articles about it. Well, open educational resources uh, are essentially you know, resources that are, that are designed to be very easily accessible, to have low barriers to entry. They don't cost anything. They can be easily downloaded on the internet and remixed and recombined. And I think you know, that comparison you made between Wikipedia and a publication like The New Yorker is, is really is something that exists in the open educational resources world as well. So The New Yorker may be the, um, the, the publication with the reputation, with the history, uh, brings a lot of value in publishing uh, a thorough story. And Wikipedia, of course, values that by recognizing it as a as a reliable source and something that is is worthy of basing a Wikipedia article on. But then when you go and produce a version of the article that is completely free, that doesn't have any paywalls, that doesn't ask you know doesn't have any advertising, doesn't ask people to subscribe, just gets you know the the goal is just to get people information. Uh, it can it, it it's sort of recognized by search engine algorithms as perhaps more valuable um, and something that uh, that people will immediately be directed to. So um, I'm, I'm kind of interested if, uh, if the three of you could comment on that, uh, that aspect of Wikipedia um, in relation to the work that you've done. Uh, but then again, uh, also let's watch the chat window and it may be that there are some more interesting questions that come up there as well. If I could reemphasize something that Lane brought up um, uh, earlier, he he showed a, a link to a Wikipedia uh, Wikipedia traffic statistics that's available publicly for any Wikipedia page. I added a link to that to the Etherpad, but I think that can be a really kind of rewarding way to evaluate who's reading your Wikipedia article. And there's some some little known uh, features of Wikipedia, like the "Did you know?" box that appears on the front page of Wikipedia. If you do a substantial contribution to a Wikipedia page, uh, you can nominate it for "Did you know?" And there's sort of a process to get 
uh, accepted into that? And did you know results in a lot of people looking at your page, which means you'll get a lot of new contributors and just a lot of people reading something you wrote. So if that's the sort of thing that interests you, uh, it's fun to look at who's looking at your page or looking at how many people are looking at your page. And did you know it can be a great way to get more people there. And just to, to illustrate that, I've, um, I've just pulled up something from the Did You Know section from today, who's a, looks like it's a football player. And you can see very clearly how uh, I think moving through the did you know process and then getting into it, you can see there's a an increase here and then suddenly a huge spike and all of a sudden we had hundreds of people looking at the article in a day when before that it had just been a small handful. Actually, I, I take that back. I think that this one, I, I think that typically a did you know will result in thousands of hits. So I think the information we're looking at is really only the flurry of activity of it going through the did you know approval process, and if we come back tomorrow or the next day, we're actually going to see a much bigger spike. So uh, I'm just I'm looking back through the the chat window here to see if anyone's been posting questions. I think all, to all of our panelists, I see Lane, you're commenting in the chat window. Feel free to just turn your microphone on and, and talk. What's up, everybody? Lovely evening. So I see Lori uh, asked, does Google put Wikipedia high on the list of hits due to how often an article is updated? Um, I think this is a, there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of different technical things that combine to make Wikipedia perform well in Google searches, but I think the the kind of the general answer is that uh, Google values content that is uh, consistently good and that is well linked uh, to other things on the internet. So Wikipedia, just by its very its its general design is uh, is very well suited to to Google. So as they make their determinations of of what content to rank higher, um, the fact that Wikipedia is well organized, that it has uh, that it has categories and that articles link to each other in a contextual way, uh, those are all the kinds of things that Google really looks for um, in in evaluating what articles are important. Pete, could you uh, could you go back to the page views of that article, the Matt Brown article? Cool, yep. thanks. So, uh, so, and then what day did it become? Uh, did you know? Was that the? Uh, I believe it's today. I mean, these these actually rotate through on an, on. I think there it's only like a six or seven hour basis these days. So I actually don't think that we're yet seeing the numbers reflecting it being on the front page. Got it. That's what you're saying in terms of the big spike. Is, I guess I guess one thing I would say is maybe it's not as apparent here on this article. Um, I think one of the fascinating things about Wikipedia is the fact that um, uh, you know is the fact that it's got so much visibility and it's so findable. Um, people will, you know, discover it, cite it, and all sorts of stuff. And, and that, I think, is part of what I was talking about before in terms of just the gratification of working on something that people will actually see. Um, I guess sometimes um, I get the sense that, you know, people are really, you know, you're almost competing for the page view, that you're almost disappointed if your page does not get as many page views as, as you were hoping it would. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, again, it's just important to really put things into perspective. Uh, you know, if you're getting a couple of hundred page views a day and you've written, you know, you've written some article about some obscure French poet that you really love, um, I mean, that might not seem like much compared to, you know, like this article right here where there is, you know, 3,000 page views uh, a couple of days ago, right? Um, but when you think about it, that means there are a couple of hundred people like around the world who are interested in the same obscure French poet you are. And I think, you know, that's sort of the long tail of interest and participation. In a lot of ways, to me, that's far more fascinating than, uh, 
then you know the pages that might be more popular for whatever reason. So I hope I hope that aspect of it is rewarding both ways. And I think I have a um, you know an example that that kind of illustrates that uh, this is something that I've uh, an, an article that I worked on a while ago um, that I you know I, I can just do a really brief uh, introduction. I, I think I've actually shown this uh, to the class before, but um, the Columbia Gorge Casino that was proposed, um, and this one, I think the the hits are really. I don't think they were ever above a hundred or two hundred per day, and maybe even substantially lower than that. I'm kind of curious to see right now what it is. But to me, that's it's. This is still an article that had an impact. Look at this. I mean, it's getting like a, a dozen hits on a good day. Um, I mean, it's not the issue that it was a year or two ago, so I know it was higher. But um, you know, if 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 it's the only thing on the web that really collects all of that information in one place that makes the the topic understandable, then the people who are interested in that topic are going to be finding it, and the you know the decision makers or the stakeholders that are involved are going to be able to find information where they wouldn't be able to if there wasn't a Wikipedia article. So, uh, yeah, I really I. I I really agree. It's 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 interesting and useful to have some sense of how many people are seeing the, seeing the article, but it's also important not to get too obsessive about it and and try to, um, you know, and and compare yourself to to a different article. Uh, you know, you may be having a much stronger impact on something that is is lower traffic uh, than you know a bigger article where your edits might be just a voice among many. Um, and there may be many, many different articles out there on the internet. So even though it's getting thousands of views, there are you know hundreds of thousands of views of various other sources on the internet. So really, a small a small article can be very satisfying to work on. So I'm I'm seeing something about mashup uh, on in the chat window. I'm going to just click that link. So. Uh, Glenn, if, do you want to maybe explain to us what we're looking at? I haven't seen this before, but it looks interesting. Yeah, Pete. So this is a, a project I built with one of my friends over a, a, a few weekends ago. It's uh, it's geolocating anonymous or unregistered contributors via their IP address um, in real time. So you're seeing approximately 15 to, to 20 percent of the edits to Wikipedia as they happen. Um, based off of their their IP address, so it just pops up a little dot and highlights the country. Uh, there's a blue dot for an addition and a red dot for a subtraction to an article and the name of the Wikipedia article they're editing. Um, it's it's just another way to look at the recent changes feed, but it, it it sort of shows all the the different ways people are editing around the world and the different sort of pulses there are to Wikipedia. I think it's a lot of fun to to look at Wikipedia's live statistics. Great. Um, and so, am I seeing this right? That Glenn just randomly uh, drew our attention to something that it happened you had built, Stephen, or was there <laughs> was there a connection I missed there? Um, I, I don't know. It went sort of viral a few weeks ago. Um, it was it was going around okay. a few different blogs. Might have seen it there. All right, so I guess we have a pretty fancy panelist here. <laughs> That's great. So we're approaching the end of the hour here. Um, I would love to sneak in another question or two uh, or comment if any of this has tipped uh, you know, prompted any ideas. If anyone wants to come back to the article that they've chosen to work on um, and has some thoughts about it. In relation to things that have been discussed, well, we may just be winding down then this week. So why don't we call it a day? And uh, and I hope you all uh, enjoy working on your articles. And if you can join us in our lab session on Thursday or Friday, if you're in the Eastern Hemisphere, Uh, we will hopefully have lots to discuss as you dig in a little more on your articles.
so thank you so much to our guests, uh, Stephen Laporte, Lane Raspberry, and Eugene Eric Kim. Uh, I think we all really enjoyed the stories that you brought to us today. I know I learned a whole lot. And uh, it's really exciting to me that even being involved in Wikipedia for, I don't know, eight years or so at this point, that I can still learn so much from uh, all the different people working on Wikipedia. So thank you for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you especially to our panelists. That was really amazing. Week.